So one of the first kind of silly and stupid things I did in Excel and spreadsheets was to plot the atomic orbitals. Um, this should really be done with proper software uh, and you get uh, patterns like this. It's basically kind of a probability distribution of where you will find an electron around an atom. Uh, they look a little bit uh, like this as well in 3D. And for the pedants, we're not plotting the original wave functions, we're plotting kind of the real component of a, uh, of a superposition of two of them. But the physics is not really worth getting into. It's more of a teaching aid and a demonstration to show that the maths work. This is not some kind of quantum mechanical magic, it is just uh, plotting things. So they do kind of have some horrible looking equations, but what you can do if you analyze these a little bit, you realize most of them are just constants. Um, what really comes into run is in this one, this is an angular component. This tells us how it varies as we go around in a circle. It's really just the x component divided by the radius. And here we mostly just an exponential function. It's an exponential decay. Uh, rho here being the radius, but it's kind of scaled. Um, not really worth going into at all. So this is just to quickly visualize. You can modify all these equations to include every single variable correctly if you want. Uh, they are all written down either in the Atkins textbook or on Mark Winter's Orbitron site. Uh, if you go to the D orbitals, for instance, and click equations, uh, he's got the list of them here. So we can take them from there. Now, how do we put this together in a spreadsheet and plot them? Uh, well, the turns out it's actually quite easy now. The first time I did this, it involved a lot of array functions and dragging and dropping, but now, it's, it's kind of really easy. So I'm going to start with a sequence function. And um, let's make this big. Let's do 51 rows, uh, one column. I'm going to start at minus 25, take a single step. We go from minus 25 to uh, plus 25. Except that's a bit big, so I'm going to divide that by 10. There we go. Now we go from minus 2.5 to 2.5. I'm going to copy that and paste it into here and swap these two numbers around. So I'm actually going to go for 51 columns of one row. Same thing. We're going from minus 2.5 to uh, 2.5. There we go. And it always passes through zero as well. That's why I've used an odd number uh, of rows and columns. And let's resize that. So now we're looking at it's about 40, 38 pixels on this screen. And let's zoom out so it's quite a big one that we're going to plot here. Usually when I'm testing this out, I'll just do 10 by 10. Uh, I think you can do it up to 100, hundreds if you want, depending on how many, just how, how many uh, cells do you want to include in it. You, it's like the, each of these is going to be a pixel. So what I'm going to do is now start giving these names because well, what I need to do is make these things look a little bit more uh, like equations, it makes it a bit easier. So I'm going to create a new name. I'm going to call this x, and it should be one. I'm going to put a hash on the end because it is a dynamic array, and I want this um, named range to reflect that. So b1 hash. I've got x, and I'm going to do y, which is actually going to be a two and a hash there. So if I okay that one, I've basically got two sequences. So let me just check that that's worked. If I take y, there we go. There's all the numbers associated with the y-axis. If I type in here in the top left corner, I can do x times y. Ah, here we go. I've now spilled across here uh, automatically. It's understood that this is 51 uh, across and this is 51 down, and it's spilled everything in. And you can kind of see there's going to be zero in the middle. It's negative here because we've got one positive number and a negative number. It's positive here because it's negative times a negative. Uh, all works really nicely. Now, if I wanted to work out, say, the radius from this origin, I'm going to type in square root of x to the power of 2 plus y to the power of 2. So now if I return that, I've got a radius instead. It's zero in the middle and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as we get up to the corner. And numbers are fine. You can kind of see a little circular pattern to them. But if I press Control-Shift-Right, Control-Shift-Down to select all of that, 
uh, I can do it with conditional formatting. So let's come to the home, conditional formatting, color scales. So basic blue to red color scale is kind of, kind of a very usual color to highlight these in. Um, but this is not the end of the story for the conditional formatting, because this, if I edit the rule and look at it, it's going from the lowest value, which in this case will be zero, to the highest value, which is blue. We don't want that for plotting uh, orbitals because uh, they are positive and negative. So we want one color for the positive value of the function and another color for the uh, negative value. So I'm gonna go stretch it from minus one to plus one just by selecting number from all of these. And I'll make the color a little bit more uh, intense just to customize it a little bit. So now, what I can see is there's a white dot in the middle for zero. It looks kind of like it's glowing, but blue as it gets more intense. And that's not the kind of the end of the story because we don't want these numbers on either. So I'm gonna select all of those again and pick this option to format the number. And I don't want numbers or anything. I'm gonna put custom and you just put three semicolons in. Uh, the semicolons kind of separate um, different types, the positives, the negatives, and zeros, and you don't put anything in there, so it just doesn't format the number. And what happens if you okay that? Gets rid of it. So there are numbers associated here, but the software's not rendering those numbers. It's just rendering it as a color. Great. Uh, final thing, I'm gonna copy that square root uh, function here. That's Pythagoras' theorem. Go back to my formulas, create a new name. I'm going to call this radius. You could call it R if you wanted to, but it will reject it and turn it into R underscore. So we may as well just call it radius. Now, if I type in radius here, same thing. It still tells me that it's going to be radius. Now, how do we start plotting orbitals? Well, let's start with the simplest. If I go to the orbitron, uh, 1s, these are perfectly circular. Uh, the function is really simple. It's just, well, kind of e to the power of minus rho over two. And rho is a function of uh, the radius. So I'm just going to simplify it and just say that this is gonna be exp minus radius. And I'm gonna keep the over two just to scale it correctly. If I return that, what I've got is a peak of the wave function in the middle. Uh, and then it exponentially decays down. So you can kind of see that circular um, pattern. That's kind of circularly symmetric. We're only just taking a slice through the middle of them. You can, uh, in theory, render um, this in three dimensions, but you'd have to like then take a, a slice through it and just set your value of Z. You couldn't quite plot this in 3D. Uh, this is not the software to do this. Right, come on, this is... This is just to show that it can be done and it's just, there's nothing magic about these things. Now, if I want to turn that into a P orbital, I just need to take uh, X and times that. So if I come back to the orbitron again, come to 2P and look at the equations, there's a little bit of a uh, more complicated bit of normalization I need to use. I'm just kind of ignore that for now. Uh, and it's just x divided by r, but also it kind of multiplies by r there, so we just do it by x. And what you can see is that's the, the shape. It is negative on one side, positive on the other. And maybe we could scale that up and down if we wanted to uh, render it in a particular way. Right, and what about a d orbital? Well, in that case, it is something like x times y. So. What we can see here is we've got a negative, positive, negative, positive. That's uh, one of these things here. And you can see this is actually called XZ. There's another one called XY. Uh, and we've also got X squared minus Y squared. So let's try what that is. Let's do X squared minus Y squared. We turn that, hey, it's a completely different thing. It's kind of rotated it 45 degrees, that's quite nice uh, to see. So this is kind of what we expect from this function. And if I change these uh, sequences just a little bit, remove that divide by 10, you can see it's 
scaled it in a slightly different way, we can now see it. Really good so far. We've, we can play with the scaling kind of manually if we want. Right, so that is dx squared minus y squared. And that makes sense, right? So where x squared is zero, straight down here, it's always gonna be equal to y squared, but the negative of it. So this is all negative down this area right here. Uh, and where y squared is zero, this is always gonna be positive. It's always gonna be equal to the x squared. Have a, have a think about how the maths works there. Uh, another couple of things we can do. Well, let's go back to it being x times that. I'm going to copy all of that and put plus y squared there. Now, there is usually a normalization constant here to scale it down, but I'm not going to bother with it for now. Um, if I add an x px orbital to a py orbital, it kind of rotates at 45 degrees. So what I could do is stick something like, uh, let's say, sine of a number, or converted to radians, um, 45 degrees times that. Copy all of that and put it before here. Change that to cosine. Then you've got 45 degrees. So what if I change this 45 degrees to maybe 20 degrees? You can see the rotation is slightly less intense. I could probably multiply the whole thing up just to make it a bit more visible. Times it by four. Yeah, we go. A bit more intense there. So if I change that to maybe minus 20, that spins it in a different direction. So we can do superpositions with this and rotate things away. Uh, and we could also get rid of maybe the y component of this. I'm going to get rid of the angle as well. So we've got what's well, basically um, that p orbital and an s orbital. We have those together. Uh, you get hybrid orbital. Might need to multiply that one up to visualize it a bit more. Uh, it kind of becomes a bit of a. Oops. Make sure my brackets are in the right place here. Yeah, what we're getting here is it's kind of a bit big on one side. Because that is what happens with a, uh, let's multiply that one bit, a hybrid orbital it kind of bulges off to one side. So we can do a lot of uh, interesting things with it, just plotting the equations out like that. And we can kind of prove that this maths does form these shapes.